Good evening. Welcome to UBC. 9 to 10 p.m. every Monday. It's Conserva Heritage. My name is Glenn Stephen Karamagi. And uh, we're going to be looking at conservation through public health. It quite looks uh, relevant, and I'm very sure you're going to be part and enjoy it. Later on, we shall open up our phone calls, and you'll be in position to call in and be part of the show. And um, we'll be good to go. In the studio, I'm not alone. Um, I'm with the doctor, which is going to be introducing herself. And probably it will be good to go. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you. Thank you for inviting me to your show. Yeah, true. Uh, you Doctor? I'm Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, founder and chief executive officer of Conservation Through Public Health, a 13-year-old NGO working in and around the national parks. Okay. And I'm also a former board member of Uganda Wildlife Authority. Uh, is, is this uh, Conservation Through Public Health a complement of Uganda Life Authority? Not necessarily, but we work very closely together with Uganda Wildlife Authority mm. because we are able to improve the relationship between Uganda Wildlife Authority and the local communities living around the park mm. by bringing health services to them. Oh, yeah, you're more focused on health services. So that means conservation through public health is as it is. It's health to the communities and to the national park. Yes, health to the communities and to the community's livestock and to the wildlife in the national park. Well, uh, how many parks are you looking at? Are we looking at all the 10 national parks and all the game reserves? We have got our main program in Wind Impenetrable National Park, mm -hmm. home to the critically endangered mountain gorillas. But we also have a program in Queen Elizabeth National Park and Pianupe Wildlife Reserve in Karamoja. And then whatever we do in Bwindi, Queen Elizabeth, Pianupe, Uwa can replicate it in other protected areas. Mm. Uh, well, uh, what, what, what is it exactly if you talk of conservation through public health? What do we look at? Is it just the way it is or it has a lot, the integrity of conservation through public health? I know we came up with the name because of experiences I had um, in when I worked as the first vet veterinary doctor in Uganda Wildlife Authority. So you're a vet? I'm a vet doctor, okay. yes. Vets actually do public health as well, yes. Okay. And actually, vets can treat human beings, but doctors cannot treat animals. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> I don't know how close you can do that because <laughs> it's sort of a show where we're going to to show us how a vet can treat a human being. <laughs> but I would love to have that in the show. But, but uh, mainly I would try to look at conservation through public health as, as something we need to, to, to look at at a, bro at a broader perspective in, in the show. Yes. Because someone down uh, the national park, uh, communities around the national park, would want to really associate with uh, such a program. And I'm, I'm very sure they would want to know exactly what you're spotting on. Yes. Um, we basically started CTPH, Conservation Through Public Health, because gorillas in Buindi got a skin disease, okay. which was fatal. Mm -hmm. It's called scabies or obuhebe in Ruchiga. Ruchiga, yes. And the baby gorilla lost almost all its hair and developed pneumonia, and the rest of the group got very sick, and they only got better when you treated them with ivermectin. I think I'm sorry to take you back. You talk of a gorilla. Explain to me what a gorilla is, because... <laughs> Many people out there I mean, uh, differentiate these apps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came across uh, you know, uh, literature where they were saying human beings are 98.7% mm -hmm. of these uh, apps, or chimpanzees, chimpanzees mm -hmm. or, or gorilla. And if you talk of obuhere, or skin, skin rashes, uh -huh. so, so it quite looks like it is related. What is a gorilla? A gorilla is a great ape, just like us. The great apes are human beings, you and me. I'm an ape. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans, which are found in Southeast Asia. Okay. Those are the four great apes. Mm. Uganda, we're fortunate to have two of the great, three of the great apes, if you count the humans as well. Okay. So <laughs> three out of the four great apes. Mm. And we're actually more closely related to chimpanzees. We share 98.7% 98.7% chimp and 98.4% gorilla, gorilla okay. which means that we can easily make each other sick. Mm. And so we found out that the scabies came from the local communities mm. living around the park. 
Yeah. Oh, producer, uh, please, uh, probably you have a, a, a gorilla around your PC, probably would want to see this gorilla very well and very fast so that we really understand uh, this gorilla that it is 98.4% uh, mm -hmm. rated to And uh, today, I, I come around the good news that I'm also an ape, <laughs> which, which uh, to a certain extent, <laughs> the doctor will have tell us more about it. Now, the gorilla had the, the, the skin rashes, the stars, like you said, and, yes. and you had to treat it. Mm -hmm. Was this related to the human being? It was. Eventually, we discovered that it came from the local community living around the park. And how did the gorillas get it? They got it when they like to go outside the national park to eat banana plants or other crops, especially banana plants. And people put out dirty clothing on scarecrows to chase away gorillas, baboons, and other wildlife. And so when that happened, baby gorillas are very curious, just like human, and they can easily touch something. And they got sick just by touching this dirty clothing. And that's how we believe they got it. C because people don't touch gorillas. You yes. know, they're wild animals. Yes. And you're not even allowed to go closer than seven meters to them. And so there wasn't an opportunity for touching. But you can get scabies if you wear somebody's sweater. Mm -hmm. You don't have to necessarily shake So if you look at that gorilla, uh, doctor, mm -hmm. it, it, it's hairy. Yes. I, I don't know if, if, if it touched my shirt that had um, a skin infection, can easily get to, 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 the, to the far, or do you call it far or hair of, 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 a of a gorilla? Yes, it can. It can, and they're curious just like us. I told you they're very closely related to us. Yes. The baby gorillas are very similar to human children. I've seen it from my own sons. Mm. And so they like to play, and probably that's how they touch the dirty clothing, because the adult gorillas wouldn't touch it. Mm. It's something foreign, but the babies are curious and they want to touch everything, and so it spreads through the groups. Gorillas groom themselves a lot. Mm. And scabies is more likely to affect the babies and the very old than the people in the middle, than the gorillas in the middle. So you treated the gorilla? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. They All the others got better apart from the baby which died. And after the baby died, that time I was- Because of that skin. Uh-huh. And that time I was the only vet in the organization. So everybody turned to me and said, we need to improve the people's health. And as I told you, a vet doctor can treat human. humans. Better. So <laughs> <laughs> the conservationists came to me and said, you have to develop a health education program so that people and gorillas don't make each other sick. And that's when we developed that program. And later on, when I left UWA to go for further studies, I came back and I thought, let's start an NGO, which not only looks at the conservation, you know, the wildlife health, but also looks at the community health around the national park. Okay. And we found out that why do they have scabies? It's a disease of poverty and poor hygiene. Government health services don't reach that far. Yeah, the park, yeah, true, mm -hmm. could be, could be and true. And uh, they really, the people themselves said, we want health services brought closer to us because we don't want to make the gorillas sick because we benefit a lot from them from tourism. Mm. And so I got a lot of support, not only from like authorities, but also from the local community. Local community. Yes. Uh, well, um, I, 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 mean, I want to ask you this question that quite looks different. Look, look, at, look, at, look at the TV. Yes. Th that is, uh, uh, you were trying to sensitize the community. I think uh, must be on, uh, uh, how do you call that? The wastes of, of, of a gorilla. A gorilla. Right now we were in, we were in the park collecting fecal samples mm -hmm. from the mountain gorilla. That's a very fresh sample. Mm. You can see lots of flies. Mm. And that's part of one of our big programs in CTPH. Yes. We improve gorilla health monitoring. Mm. And by regularly collecting samples from them, gorillas make a nest every night and defecate in it like you saw. Ooh. And from there, we're able to tell if they're sick or, or if they're not. picking up a disease from humans or livestock when they go outside the park. Mm. And we're able to work closely with UWA, advise them, and react quickly. Now, uh, besides uh, the skin, uh, disease you, you talked earlier on. Yes. Uh, is there any other disease that is so close to human and the gorilla? Yes, like over there when we're looking at the fecal sample, we're looking at intestinal diseases. Like for example, they can get diarrhea from us, they can get typhoid. Anything that makes us sick, mm. they can also get sick. And that's why when people enter the park, they tell you, if you want to go to the toilet, you dig a hole 30 centimeters deep. Okay. If you're not able to do it yourself, the ranger or tracker can do it for you because we don't want them to pick up our diarrhea and okay. other diseases. Mm. But they also get flu, and that's actually the worst. 
flu is the worst the gorilla because you can sneeze on them even at three meters and they can pick up your flu just like you can get flu from your child or from your wife mm. you can also get flu from the gorillas or anybody who you're in close contact with so this and is what um, we call wildlife health yes and conservation yes that's our wildlife health and conservation program within ctph Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> it's, 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 it's getting more uh, interesting w when I look at how you follow up these gorillas and how you get down to the nitty gritty of, uh, you know, of the gorilla, the health, and, and, and how you end up getting a solution to it. Yes. So that, that, that means that the medication a human being takes is what the gorilla can take. Yes. The medication is the same. We are very closely related and we can easily make each other sick. The difference is people can easily go to the doctor gorillas cannot easily go to the doctor so we try as much as possible to prevent gorillas and people making each other sick so they say a long time ago uh, we human being we could easily find the medicine in the trees yes how comes the gorillas can't find that actually that's a very good question chimpanzees have been seen to swallow certain leaves when they have a lot of worms in their body and we believe that gorillas also do the same, but we just haven't done studies on it yet. But we may find that whether gorilla takes is what the traditional healer also takes or gives to people. Mm. And so one thing I've learned having worked with gorillas for over 20 years is that we can learn so much from them. The food, the medicines they take, the plants they eat, we might find that they're the same plants that our traditional healers use to treat intestinal disease, to treat skin disease. So it's very important as we study these animals which are so closely related to us, we can learn so much from them. Well, uh, you've talked much on, on gorilla. Is there any other animal besides a gorilla, maybe a chimpanzee, from the ape family? Yes. That uh, you, you're working close? I've worked, actually I worked with chimpanzees before I started working with gorillas. Mm -hmm. My very first field study was in Budongo Forest as a vet student studying the chimpanzees in Budongo, looking at their parasites. And I also worked in Entebbe Zoo before it became Uganda Wildlife Education Center, looking after the orphan chimps. And I've done some work on Ngamba Island. So I've also worked with chimps. Actually, my most experience is with great apes. Gorillas a bit more than chimpanzees. Okay. Yes. Uh, but the, uh, outside the apes, there's no business with the animals. Oh, no. I, I, I work with all animals. The vet training trains you to work with all animals. Now, how, how do you find, uh, besides uh, the gorillas and the communities around Bwindi? Yes. And um, another park that harbors gorillas? Mugahinga, Mugahinga National Park. I know there you're very robust. Now, when we move out of Mugahinga and, and Bwindi, mm -hmm. and Queen Elizabeth, you said? Yes, we work in Queen Elizabeth. And over there, we try and prevent disease, because our what we're doing is called One Health, which is addressing human health, animal health, and environmental health together. So in Queen Elizabeth National Park, we use that same model we have in Buindi, and we work closely with Uganda Wildlife Authority mm. to, and the local communities to look at diseases in the buffaloes, the cattle, and the people. Some people drink milk, which is not boiled, and they can get tuberculosis, brucellosis, which are very, very difficult to treat, by the way. They can take months and months, okay. and they can get it from cattle. Sometimes the cattle can get it from the buffaloes, or vice versa. So we use that same One Health model in Queen Elizabeth. Anthrax is another one. Okay. The hippos in Queen Elizabeth died of anthrax, and some people who ate them have ever died of anthrax or have ever got very sick. So we try and tell people not to eat meat from an unknown you source. You treated them? They were treated by the district medical officer. Okay. <laughs> but he told <laughs> us I about it. Find much about that. But then, <laughs> um, besides looking at what happens, those days. Yes. Do we, do we used to have those diseases you mentioned? Because mm -hmm. it quite looks like it's just famous of recent. And we, the communities and, and conservationists, feel like I it's foreign or it is exotic. Mm -hmm. We think we, th we never used to have uh, these diseases. You, you named them. Um, how do you call them? Scabies, scabies anthrax. Scabies, we've heard of scabies. Anthrax, uh -huh. TB. TB that, that, one that, that, that one we know, yeah, true. <laughs> Brucellosis. <laughs> that one. Uh huh. Brucella, they call it Brucella. Mm -hmm. That one's called Brucella. Brucella is something we've just come to know, not more than a decade. Yes. Has it been there for, a, for, for years? It has. Brucellosis has been there for a long time. It's just that when someone has gets fevers, they think it's malaria. Mm. 
and they treat them for malaria. It's only when they're not getting better that then they start to look at brucellosis. So it can be got from animals, especially people who are closely with cattle can easily get brucellosis. So it causes abortion in cows and goats. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> literally, <laughs> people living around uh, national parks should mm. be very careful when they find an animal dead and they just want to go for, go for the meat and maybe they want to kill it and have it. Yes. So literally, they should stop poaching and having this meat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because they, they could make them sick. You know, if you just eat meat and you don't know why it, why it died and you just eat it, you put yourself, your life in danger. And that of your family and everyone else who shares the meat. Even the whole community can get affected because these poachers sometimes sell the meat in the village. Mm -hmm. And then, like example, a hippo can feed the whole village. Yeah. So hippo if a hippo has died of anthrax and you sell the meat in the village, mm. everyone is going to get sick. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you so much for being part of Conserve Our Heritage. My name is Glenn, together with the Dr. Gladys. Kalema, uh, we are looking at conservation through public health. Many people around Windy and um, Gahinga must have uh, seen the doctor around and trying to tell them more about the health and how important and how close they are with these gorillas. My name is Glenn. We are still looking at um, wildlife uh, health in the segment as part of um, um, conservation through public health. But with wildlife health, it quite looks like you a master in here. As a vet doctor, yes, I pretty much know that uh, you, you, you've been looking at the communities around these national parks. Yes. Do they have the similar challenges as far as health is concerned, them and the animals? If, if, if there's a, a, an outbreak of a disease, uh, pro let, let's say hippos in Queen Elizabeth. Yes. Are there higher chances that the communities around are going to face the same challenge? Yes, there is, because if they eat like the anthrax, they eat the hippo, they can get exposed to anthrax. And that's why we work, what we do is we strengthen community-based health care, mm. which is something that Ministry of Health really supports and promotes, because they don't have enough medical staff to reach people right in their homes. And so they, uh, they've endorsed the village health team structure, and we work closely with the VHTs, train them to do conservation work, and we call them village health and conservation teams. Mm. So as they're going to people's homes, promoting hygiene and sanitation, you know, don't eat, you know, food safety. They're promoting nutrition. They're, pr they're looking out for people who are sick and referring them to the center, like who may be coughing a lot or scabies. Mm. Those very same people, they may also promote, s refer people who may have HIV or HIV suspects. They do a lot of healthcare to improve people's health seeking behavior. And then at the same time, they also promote family planning, believe it okay. or not. <laughs> no, that, that's the thing we're going to be, when, when we return, we're going to have a, a simple break. And when we return, uh, definitely we're going to be looking at community health, our alternative um, conservation, of course, when it comes to communities around the park. I'm with Dr. Gladys Kalama in the studio. The show is Conserve Our Heritage. My name is Glenn Stein Karamagi. We'll be having a simple breather. And when we return, we have a lot to discuss. Don't forget to be part of the show later on. Uh, but the number you can send SMS is 70 uh, 340 And later on, we shall open up our phone calls and you'll be part of the show after the break. <laughs>
Welcome back from that simple break. You're still watching UBC TV, and this is Conserve Our Heritage. My name is Glenn Stephen Karamagi. The show is uh, Conserve Our Heritage. The topic is conservation through public health. And uh, in studio, I'm with Dr. Gladys Kalemazuksoka, the founder and the chief executive officer of conservation through public health. We are looking at wildlife, health, and conservation, but not only that, we'll still go be looking at community health as related to what she's been telling us, in case you're just joining us. <laughs> Welcome to UBC TV. And of course, uh, now, uh, doctor, we, had, we have community health. Yes. As something very, very sensitive. You've been telling us how you help uh, the Ministry of Health and how you can sensitize and educate more. But this one is more related to wildlife. Yes. Do you think that is enough for the community? Actually, the main thing that we do is we promote behavior change because a lot of the reasons why community health is not good enough is because people do things that make them get diseases. So the village health and conservation teams promote behavior change. Mm. If someone is healthy and hygienic, they're less likely to get TB, scabies, and other diseases. So we really focus on behavior change communication. And then our volunteers, our VHCTs, Village Health and Conservation Team volunteers, we have about one to two per village, go and also tell people about family planning. Okay. <laughs> and how did we get into family planning? We found out that many people had too many children, they couldn't give them proper health care, they couldn't give them a proper education, and they couldn't balance the family budget. Mm. And so if they can't do that, they're more likely to get sick, and they, they can't break the poverty cycle, and they always have to go into the park to collect firewood, to, get, to collect food, to feed their families. And so improve, re helping people to understand that, that they should have the children they can afford. I'm seeing how you're doing it. Yes. Yeah, it quite looks like um, you have them all. He's going to fetch the <laughs> firewood and, and things like that. Yes. <laughs> so we try and really educate people that it's very important to have the children you can afford. Mm. So when we started the program, people were having as many as 10 children per family. You oh. know that Ugandan average is seven, there were at 10. Could you believe it? Every year somebody's having a baby. But now when we started our program, women are not having babies every year anymore. Mm. They wait and they can do other things with their lives. Some of them are starting businesses. Even those who have, our favorite testimony is a lady who had three girls and she said, I'm not having any more. And her girls are gonna have the best future in the world. And so this is deep right down at the borders mm. of the National Park, Windy National Park. So you don't tell me that uh, you, you're also um, preaching family planning. I wouldn't say preaching, but telling people the benefits of family planning. Family planning. And we, what we do is our volunteers go out there and even those who have had too many children say how they've suffered. They've had land wrangles. Mm. They've really suffered as a result of having too many children. And then those who have few children say how they do it. And so it's a very important part of our program. And it's something that Uganda Wildlife Authority is very interested in, mm -hmm. in doing in other protected areas as well. Because places like Mount Elgon, where they have landslides and very, very high population densities. So it looks like everyone is protecting what he is looking or having more interest in. Uganda Wildlife Authority are looking at the national parks. They're much yes. interested in them. And then the communities around are also looking at their benefits. Yes. Uh, they, they feel like they have, have free access to the park and, and they have to have as many children as they can because they feel the land is theirs. Yes. You're telling them you're conserving uh, for, for them. The animals are theirs. Yes. But at the same time, you're telling them have few kids because they're going to have challenges with this land. This land belongs to the National Park. We're keeping uh, it for you. No, actually, the, the message that we take, which is very strong, is balancing the family budget. If you have fewer children, you reduce poverty in your home. And we have a flip chart, the one that you saw there with the bad family. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. not the bad family, but the family that is really struggling. They have too many children and they can't balance the family budget. And the second family, mm -hmm. which has four children, they're all going to school and eventually they graduate. The boy becomes a ranger, the girl becomes a nurse and they have a graduation party. And you ask the community, which family would you rather be? And that has really changed people. <laughs> it's very <laughs> interesting. Now, what is the alternative? If, if you're not giving me a chance to have as many kids as I, as I want, not because you're denying me a chance, but you're telling me how good it is to have less uh, children, but you're not giving me an option. 
is there an option, probably an alternative, uh, as far as business is concerned? Because these communities bordering the national parks, most of them don't have um, uh, any alternative apart from poaching, maybe something s little like farming, and, 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 and the, the life goes on, you know? Yes. Do you give them alternatives? Yes, and actually that's why we started the Alternative Livelihood Program. Um, although our main focus is conservation and health, mm -hmm. but we got into alternative livelihoods because we found out that many people were unhealthy because they're poor. Okay. So as much as you're saying have fewer children, another way to reduce poverty is by improving livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And one thing we discovered is that around the park there are very many people who grow crops and many of them are coffee farmers, mm -hmm. but they are not getting a good market for their coffee. Yes, yes. And so in the dry season especially, they can sometimes go into the park just for food to feed their families. It's a food security issue. Mm. And so we found out that actually they also grow very good coffee. And we found that if we could link them to is a this local the coffee market. I'm seeing here? I yes, I can give it to. Is it my notes <laughs> from my manager? Yeah, it's called Gorilla Conservation. Coffee thing next, next to that. But uh, is this my notes from my Yes, <laughs> you ah, can I share. You can share with, with, with my manager. Yes, and everybody <laughs> in the office can share. I think you give us like three <laughs> you, because I mean this is what you do uh, <laughs> so this this is directly from the Bwindi farmers because this coffee is not from any other part of Uganda but where the gorillas are from mm. because and we call it gorilla conservation coffee because it's there to protect the mountain gorillas okay that's why we call it gorilla conservation yeah. coffee and we've teamed up together with wild wildlife fund Switzerland mm. who gave us initial support because they said grant funding is not enough to support the conservation needs, you know, donor funding. Yes. Why can't we find a method of getting something that's market-oriented that can support the conservation needs? Mm. And that's when Gorilla Conservation Coffee came about. And where they work with other people in other conservation, they call us conservation entrepreneurs. Yes. Other conservation oh entrepreneurs yeah. all over the world. Mm. It's the same message. If you have something that can generate income where you are, tell us about it so that we can support the communities through social enterprise rather than just looking for funds because the problem with these coffee farmers if we get funding from a donor to support them where we give them premium prices for good coffee mm. and we make sure that we try our best to sell it okay. like to the lodges the tourists love it because they've just been to the park they've met the community they're very emotional and they want to buy this coffee mm. and then they can also find it at Entebbe duty free and in the lodges and at banana boat but so that, that's, I think it's around Windy and Mugahinga. Does it cross that line, or you just get this from Windy to, to UDC? <laughs> maybe this is for me. Thank you very much. It's for you. But but, but <laughs> do you really have them all over the Kampala? Because I'm pretty sure when you when you talk of of, of um, gorilla conservation coffee, yes, yeah, uh, we, we are tired of looking at things that are imported. This is not imported. This is fresh from our Uganda. <laughs> yeah. our beautiful country Uganda so this coffee we process it everything is done in Uganda yeah. so that if a tourist takes it home they're taking the finished product and all the value chain remains in Uganda and we've teamed up with the lodges you know the lodges in Bwindi mm. um, the lodges in some of them have branches like Marasa has branches in Bwindi Queen Elizabeth Murchison but we have Do Roma you have Lodge the around Kampala? And, uh, not yet no but we have them in Banana Boat have you heard of Banana Boat? hearing it for the first time here. It's a shop in Kampala that sells things connected to a cause. Oh. So they'll sell crafts made by disabled women or mm. that's why this coffee fits in with their values. And those are the kind of people we are targeting, people who want to buy something connected to a cause. So when you go to Entebbe Duty Free as you're leaving the airport, people want souvenirs for their families. Mm. And even if they've not made it to Bwindi, they can say, oh, at least we have something we can take home. That okay. connects us to Bwindi and that's a very good gift so for that's our family. The community, th those are the community members. Yes. Very active. That's yes. the coffee. This is the coffee you're having in here. This so is the very is coffee we're having. Is it processed from Bwindi or something like that or in Kampala here? It's processed in Kampala oh. at New Cafe at the moment or any other processor, but we process it mainly at New Cafe. Mm. And then we seal everything is done here. It's roasted, packaged, and then even this branding is done in Kampala by a, a local company here called add value mm. and then we are able to sell it here and the, the plan is also maybe to sell it abroad but the main point is that we want the farmers to be able to 
be to have their coffee. Like when tourists come to Buindi, they don't only have to trap gorillas, they can also visit the coffee farmers. Oh. Community tourism is something that is U Uganda Tourism Board is really promoting, mm. and we want to also be able to promote it through the coffee safaris. And over there we have like Safari, he's a community member, mm -hmm. he's a conservationist, very strong conservationist, mm. but also managing the coffee project. And he really wants to make sure that we work closely with these farmers, that they don't have to go back into the forest to look for food. And so it's an alternative, wood. don't go hunting. Yes. Called poaching. Mm -hmm. Don't go for anything that can get you close to the animals and maybe bring other problems. Exactly, so even such as diseases as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the best thing is have what you can afford and maybe um, if you're a farmer, you have yes. coffee, uh, it's the best you can promote. Is there anything bigger than or more than coffee or it's still coffee for now? It's still coffee for now. Mm. <laughs> We're working very closely with different groups and uh, as I mentioned, and it's still coffee for now. Another thing also which is unique about this coffee is that a donation Whenever someone buys a bag, mm -hmm. a donation is given to conservation through public health to continue to support community health and wildlife conservation. So it's the social impact and the environmental impact is actually the main thing about this. Mm -hmm. And that's why World Wildlife Fund, which is one of the biggest conservation NGOs in the world, is supporting this. Now, <laughs> uh, uh, besides Abuindi, yeah, I, I talked about Queen Elizabeth earlier on, but I didn't bring it to uh, straight to me. I didn't, I didn't understand it well. Uh, and it quite looked like uh, an, 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 a Queen Elizabeth. Yes. And Renzori, of course, yes. the two are very close. Is yes. there a program that is starting soon? Because I think these guys don't do coffee. I think they do a lot of um, carbon and something like that around Renzori. Do you have a, a future plan for that? or We actually, in, in Renzori... Oh, first wait for, do, for a donation. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. In Renzori, actually, WWF Uganda is doing something with coffee farmers. It's a separate program from what we are doing. And also, Good African Coffee um, have always been getting coffee from Renzori farmers. Okay. We are calling ours Gorilla Conservation Coffee because we want to focus on gorilla mm -hmm. protected areas. Windy, Mugahinga, mm -hmm. and that's something that CTPH, because our main focus has been gorillas, we do it. And then we work closely with other groups who are promoting and helping such farmers in other protected areas. They can learn from what we're doing, we can learn from what they're doing, mm -hmm. and that's how we plan to grow that alternative livelihood aspect of the program. Well, Steve, we've got <laughs> been looking at your SMS uh, because I have a couple of them, and uh, make sure you're part of the show. Shall open up our phone calls later on 0751 822 511. That's the number you was calling in. But uh, District Health Office Kanungu supports the project. Yes. Does this go down to Kanungu as well? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he's the big one of the biggest champions of our work mm. and we work very closely with him mm. he enabled us to start he's a politician no he's mm. a district health officer okay a very experienced technical mm. doctor who's been there for very many years he was there when we launched the NGO mm -hmm. at Ruhija mm. um, he represented the the, L the LC5 at the time Josephine Cassia mm. and so Dr. Mm. Steven Sebude is very closely connected to what we do he it's because of him that we have an MOU that can enable us to improve community health around the protected area. H how bad are these communities? Because when you're in Kampala, we don't really understand how bad these communities are doing. Yes. Now, if you come up with that big support, at yes. times, it, it looks like it's not this. But we're going to be picking up our first caller here. Yubisalo. <laughs> Yubisalo. Hello? Hello, you're live on UBC. Yes. Who's this we're talking yes. to? This part in this present here. Sorry? There's a talk here. Can you please speak louder, please? Yeah, may I? Yes, hello? Yes, please, you're live. Yes, we are talking to Father Charles from Arua. Yes, Mukula from Arua. Yes, we mm. are talking to Father Charles from Arua. Mm, okay. We are talking to Father Charles from Arua. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, you are, you are speaking to Father Charles from Arua. Yes, Charles from Arua, go ahead. Yes, I have two questions here to doctor. Two questions to doctor? Yes. Uh-huh. One. Mm. I heard that uh, uh, this Ebola here we also get from, uh, from some of these animals. Okay. And uh, may I know what they also from, from gorillas, can we get Ebola? 
From Gola, you can also get a bola. Mm. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, we lost him. But it's very clear. He made a point. Yes. Do we get a bola from Gorilla Russo? Yes, we can. He's ac he's actually, his question is very good. Mm. Um, in Central Africa, Gabon, Congo Brazzaville, many gorillas have died of Ebola, mm. and they got it from, we don't know what it's where it's from, but we think it's most likely from fruit bats in the forest. So it's, it's so not they've from died the of gorillas? A, no, it's come from the, the fruit bats okay. in the forest. Mm. The gorillas and the chimpanzees have died of Ebola, and people who've eaten these gorillas, because in Central Africa and West Africa, people eat gorillas. Huh. In Uganda, we don't. In so East you Africa, we don't. So you want to when I eat a gorilla, it's as much as I've eaten a, a human being. Since we're all <laughs> apes, 98. Some people think that if you eat a gorilla or a chimpanzee, mm. you can become as strong as them. And that's Ooh. their cultural belief. Mm. So in fact, in those countries, it's a delicacy mm. in some of those countries. And people who have eaten those gorillas have died of Ebola. So it's really a big issue there. Luckily, in Uganda, the gorillas have not had Ebola. I hope they never get it. Now, because it's, we would, it would be terrible for us to lose our only four hundred mountain gorillas. Yeah. Now, the, the point is, I think mm -hmm. you make to drive the point home. Yes. Is like, do we get Ebola from gorillas? We only do get. Do gorillas it have Ebola? O also, gorillas get Ebola from somewhere else. Gorillas get Ebola from somewhere else. Most yes. likely. Most likely bats. Oh, bats. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Every wound of bats. Um. We, there's still CDC and other s scientists are trying to find out whether it's fruit bat or insectivorous bat, mm. but bats give Marburg. Mar have you heard of Marburg? Yes. It's very similar to Ebola, and that one has been proven that it comes from bats. Okay. So that's why everybody suspects that most likely Ebola mm. could come from bats. So gorillas living in the forest, they're in close contact with these bats, mm. they die of Ebola, and anyone who eats the gorilla, mm is going to die of Ebola, for sure. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, the, the, the number is very clear. It's 0751 The other one is an SMS line. Don't call it. Just send or text uh, to 0703644428. That's for texts. But for calling in, 0751 I'm with Dr. Kalema Zuksoka, and we're looking at uh, conservation through public health. And this is conserve our heritage. It cuts across. Before we picked up the caller, uh, you, I really wanted you to tell me more how, how bad are these communities? As in, poor? How poor are they? Is that bad that they are not? The way we look at them. Um, because if tourists are going down to the parks and these communities around the parks, they must be sh sharing something with, and they are okay. Yes, yes, that's a very good question. As poor as the communities are, mm. the ones that are bordering the park have started to benefit from tourism. And Uganda is considered one of the best countries in East Africa, or in Africa, mm. for sharing tourism revenue with the community. It's an act of parliament mm. that 20% of the park entry fee has to go to the local community. Okay. It's not yet been picked up in Tanzania, but in Uganda, we do that, so that the communities become part of the tourism. And also, there's a lot of effort not only from our NGO, but other NGOs like Yukota and others, International Gorilla Conservation Program, mm. to make sure that the communities benefit from tourism by selling crafts, by uh, you know having good restaurants. Mm. You know, Kobati focuses on making sure that there's also turi homestead tourism in these protected areas. So we all find ways, other groups are trying to find ways of making sure that they're part of the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. They serve food, they provide accommodation, they give up, they have crafts. All of us are trying to see how the communities can be part of conservation. But for sure, Uganda Wildlife Authority is mandated to give 20% of the park entry fee to, to the, the local com community. Yes. And that is a very big, something uh, that the uh, districts appreciate and the communities as well. We have a caller, doctor. Hello. You're live on UBC. Hello, I'm Habib from Kamoli. Sorry? I'm Habib from Kamoli. Habib from Kamoli. Yes, uh, what I would like to know is the difference between uh, the chimpanzee and the gorilla. The difference between the chimpanzee and the gorilla. Yeah. The doctor is in the house. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> it's a simple question. She has worked with chimpanzees and gorillas. He's right. I would ask the same question. What's the difference between the two? They look alike. <laughs> Producer, please, you can get us a chimpanzee and a gorilla here because 
<laughs> in fact, as I was about to say, showing yeah. the photograph of both of them is easier than just describing it. Mm. But gorillas generally have a big head. They have like a boss, a very big head, and they have a lot more hair. Mm -hmm. They're much heavier than chimpanzees. A gorilla can go up to 200 kilos in weight. Hey. A chimpanzee um, does not really go beyond 50 or 60 kilos. Mm. Um, chimpanzees have smaller heads. Mm. They have um, much less hair. Okay. They have a swelling on the back when they're in estrus. So th there's a number of differences between them, but if you look at them, their faces are very different. Yeah, uh, uh, and their as structure the is very different. trying to get us the, the yes. faces and how they look like because mm -hmm. we'll be describing them. Uh, in behavior. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, is there in in behavior, mm -hmm. actually, chimpanzees are what we are, and gorillas are what <laughs> we want to be. <laughs> I'll not take that. I don't know if I'll take it, but <laughs> if you're telling me chimpanzees are what we are. Uh, yes. As in? In behavior. Chimpanzees fight a lot. They're very aggressive. You know, mm -hmm. they squabble over little things, and they're unpredictable. Whereas gorillas are very gentle. They're gentle giants. And they're like very peaceful, and so peop people so often that's say that's the chimpanzee. those right. are the chimpanzees. Uh -huh. They are very aggressive, as you can see. Mm. They're smaller than gorillas. They are aggressive. <laughs> they scream a lot. They th they fight this a lot. This is what we are. They're really? unpredictable. Those are chimps <laughs> in Nyama Island. Our behavior is like chimps. Uh -huh. You know, we're always arguing over little things. Uh. And then <laughs> gorillas, in the other hand, mm. they are gentle. Peace loving. Uh, but again, this, is, this is the gorilla now. Yes, gorillas are gentle, uh. gentle giants, very peaceful. Uh. They have very but peaceful they seem lives. They look alike. And, 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 you know. and so we, our character should be more and more like gorillas mm. and less and less like chimps. Mm. So that's why we say chimps are what we are and gorillas is what we want to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're much into these animals and now you, you, you're taking us to be them and this is what <laughs> will be <laughs> the but thank you very much for that question hope you really got the difference at least with the time we shall have it at full strength please don't call the number if it's for sending sms i know the number to call is 0751 855 that's the number you can call uh the 0703 640 is for just sms and you'll be part of the show right away Doctor, as we're looking at uh, summing up uh, this, uh, when do you think you go down to other parks? The program is good, con uh, conservation through public health. Yes. It, it's, a, it's a very good thing that you would want it, all the 10 national parks and the game reserves. Yes. Mm -hmm. But so far, I think you have few national parks with Buindi. Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and uh, we started a small program in Pianupe Wildlife Reserve mm -hmm. with funding from the French government. Yeah. Pianupia borders which districts? It's in Nakapiripiri, mm -hmm. um, Amudat, mm -hmm. those districts over there. Okay. That, that southern side of Karamoja. Mm -hmm. And the main program we have is in Nakapiripiri district. Nakapiripiri. Nak Nakapiripiri. That one. <laughs> 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 but one way that we can reach, it doesn't necessarily be that our NGO goes and sets up a program in every park, mm. but our NGO can teach the staff of Uganda Wildlife Authority who are relevant, like the veterinary staff and the community conservation staff mm. to do the work that we are doing. Does and also other does NGOs. Every park, uh, do they have veterinary officers? Every they, park they don't, unfortunately. There, there is isn't enough funds yet yeah. to have a vet in every park. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a vet in every, maybe in every conservation area, like Murchison, Kidepo has a vet, and then Buindi. Um, okay, I would say Hello. Queen Elizabeth National Park. We have a caller. You live at UBC. Hello? Yes, please. Yes, yes. I'm Robert calling from Kasese. Robert from Kasese. Yes. Mm. Uh, um, hello. Yes, you live, Robert. Go ahead. Yes. Mm. Just I wanted to confirm that the... Hello. Yes, you live. Go ahead, yes. Robert. Yes, I'm Robert calling from Kasese. Yes, Robert, go ahead. Yes, in Hamukungu at the parish. I cut the subcounty. Mm. Yes, I wanted. Yes, I just wanted to confirm the good work done by Doctor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Some <laughs> big job mm. towards conserving and letting the communities know about the LSA and public. Okay. 
So we are very happy only that I pray that he can extend some more program at Kasese as how yes. he used to do. We thank you very much, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Robert. <laughs> thank you for that. And we'll tr look and see how we can do some more work with you in Kasese. That's for sure. And actually, that community has been very good. They've rescued two baby elephants. Wow. In yes, Kasese. Robert and his community, yes, that were drowning in near Hamukungu village. Mm. And they've been taken to, you can see them now when you go to the what, Uganda Wildlife Education Center, yeah, where yeah. I in Entebbe, okay. where I actually sit on their board. Mm. And they're really helping people who would never s visit an elephant or see it. You can go and see it there. So that means mm. in Kasese. One is called Charles Hamukungu, the other one is called Living. Yeah, named after the people who rescued them. And that's really, because an elephant is also one of the critically endangered species in Uganda. Mm. And the we've helped to improve the community attitudes that they're very willing and happy to rescue baby elephants without feeling scared to do that. Okay. And the people who rescued them have become honorary wardens. Wow, that's yes. interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much for being part of uh, Conserve Our Heritage. It happens every Monday, 9 to 10 p.m. My name is Glenn Steen Kramagi. Tonight we have the doctor, uh, she's in, in charge of conservation through public health. Those in Windy, Mugahinga, Queen Elizabeth must have spotted you around, telling yes. them much and uh, their help and, and the animals around. And people in Kasasa, thank you very much that you've been given credit here by the doctor, that you've been part of conservation for quite a while, mm -hmm. that you did just chew two elephants. And I think that is something very, very good. They never thought of eating it. No, they didn't. Because and actually, I don't think they eat elephants there. No, I, I mean, uh, we've had cases where people hunt elephants. And it's true. Is it only for the, the ivory or...? It can be both, both the ivory and the, and the meat. You're but right. But people can say we're just mm -hmm. specifically restoring them. And mm -hmm. well, that's interesting that even they did restore before the lion did. Uh-huh, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> they did very well. Exactly. So, Doctor, as, as you're finalizing, yes. uh, time is against us. And I think we would be having some message, a uh, message to the public and the next step. Yes, I think I would like to encourage Ugandans mm. that, you know, we have, we're very lucky, we're blessed with a lot of beautiful wildlife mm. that is not there in many other countries in the world. Mm. So we want to, I want to encourage Ugandans to visit the national parks. You know, good enough, the Uganda Ministry of Tourism is supporting Tulambule, Honorable Chiwanda. But I want to encourage you all to visit the national parks, conserve our wildlife. The communities around the park continue to conserve the wildlife and work closely with Uganda Wildlife Authority and the NGOs to make sure that our wildlife continues to grow and our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be able to really enjoy what God has given us. And uh, for more information, please visit our website, www.ctph.org. And yes, the we shouldn't wait for people from other countries to tell us how good our wildlife is. It's not for them only. It's ours. It's ours, and it, we need to have a sense of ownership. We work with the Batwa, for example. Mm. They're now appreciating the wildlife, the Batwa pygmies. Mm. We work with the communities around Buindi, Queen Elizabeth, Karamoja. They're all appreciating wildlife. So I think it's our natural heritage, and we should all enjoy it and make the most of it. Well, Thank you. Well mm -hmm. said by the doctor. Thank you very much for being part of Conserve Our Heritage this Monday. It has been Dr. Kalem, Gladys Kalema Zikusoka. And the topic has been very clear, conservation through public health. I've been Glenn Steele Karamaji. Enjoy the rest of the programming. The news up next. Keep it UBC. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>